full swing when you would hope that after so many decades of uh, decisions saying that racial injustice is something that as, as a society we have a responsibility to fight. We're still doing that. We're still here. And she said, well, the most important thing, I think, is to put what happened in your movement and the oppression faced by lesbian and gay people in the curriculum. Teach it. Don't forget it. Don't allow people to erase it. And that's, I think, what's so very powerful about the Legacy Wall and the efforts that you're making. in the courts right now. 
And I think you're exactly right that Romer versus Evans is one of the most important cases, um, because as Victor pointed out, one of the holdings was that the law in Colorado, the referendum, was inexplicable for any reason other than animus. Right. And HB2 kind of begs that question. Um, another thing that Romer versus Evans did was to use, so that was one holding, um, that it was what they called a literal denial of equal protection. Uh, another was to use more traditional equal protection analysis. And as Windsor and, and uh, Obergefell evidence, I think the court is, is gradually moving away from the familiar tiered equal protection analysis that we were taught you know, back in the 90s. But I still think it's useful as a framework to evaluate what that law did. What is the compelling governmental interest? What is even the important governmental interest that that law serves? Where are the, where are the examples of harassment and violence in bathrooms that needed to be cured by this? What is being served by this law other than the demonization of a group of people? And I'm hopeful that we will get a good decision, especially as the appeals court in that area um, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals recently ruled in favor of a transgender student um, about the transgender student's need to access sex segregated uh, facilities in school. But, but let me just focus in not just on that, but also on the fact that it doesn't allow any city in North Carolina to pass a protection law. So, I mean, that would seem to be. That's a good parallel, too. Rubber versus Evan. Yes. Um, I am not a lawyer. Uh, no, we know that. And I'm sitting next to uh, everything I think you over. Uh, <laughs> but my, my take on it, because I look at everything also through a political lens, is that these these things that people concoct, um, they their ultimate purpose is to get people to go vote according to the conservative will of the people who are putting these things forward. Um, the same way uh, all the marriage uh, bills that were coming up during the, like, from 2000, or through 2010, it was like he, they were trying to do the, the federal constitutional amendment, and George Bush came out in favor of it. Um, these things ultimately would never have probably survived, but their purpose was to actually inflame people and to pump money into organizations and pump money into campaigns and to help define which, you know, do you support this law or don't you support this law? So I think a lot of these things, even though they may make no sense from a, a, an actual judicial standpoint because we sort of know where the arc of history is bending on this, that's not going to like forestall their like short term goal, which is actually to fuel the political process in those locations. That's that's just my take on it. Joshua. So my question is for Kanal. Um, so what was specific about the Obergefell case that the Supreme Court chose to pick that instead of the other one, say like the Oklahoma case, was there something, did you feel like, do you feel like, because I know you're not them, you can't, it but no. yeah, did you feel like it, it had set a higher precedent, like it had something inside of that case or an aspect of that case that would set a higher precedent, that's why they chose that one, or? Well, it is an interesting question, and given that the country was being transformed by all of these federal court decisions around the country that were requiring that same-sex couples be allowed to marry. And when the court denied cert in the fourth, you know, the, the seventh, the ninth, the tenth circuits, uh, it became clear that there was really no taking that back. Um, we all became very optimistic that the court was going to grant us a win if it ever ended up taking a case. And when there's a, a circuit split, meaning when one circuit is disagreeing with another circuit court of appeals, then the Supreme Court absolutely feels obligated. And so that's why it did it. Obergefell was actually a consolidated group of cases in the, in the Sixth Circuit that included a Michigan case, a Kentucky case, a Tennessee case, and an Ohio case. Um, so all of these cases were being heard at the same time. Um, am I correct to then uh, in my understanding, there's about 200 anti-LGBT bills in, in some process across the country. Yes. Is that? 200 yeah. anti-LGBT bills currently around the country. Some of them focus on religious refusals. Some of them are trans-specific. Some of them are sort of omnibus bad. Yeah. 
And the Ninth Circuit ruled in favor of the, the state of Washington. And then the pharmacists who were challenging this, who were funded by the Alliance Defending Freedom, um, which is a, a big anti-gay organization based in Arizona, uh, petitioned for cert to the U.S. Supreme Court. When the U.S. Supreme Court denied cert, it said, we're not taking the case, and allowed that victory for the state of Washington and for women to stand. Um, so it's a good thing, but it emphasizes the importance of having nine justices. <laughs> and what was the basis of the dissent? They felt that there was a free exercise claim, that the, the pharmacists were being um, deprived of their right to free exercise of religion because they were being forced to sell prescriptions to people when they had a religious objection to doing so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it almost got served. Yeah. So I, my thank claim you. is, I'm sorry. No, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I think mine is sort of a combination of all of them. I think the, the fault line that's really growing in this country is between civil liberties and this assertion that religious belief trumps <laughs> um, <laughs> civil rights. I think that, that I had to say that. Yeah. I got to come up with a new word for Trump. Yeah. Um, Trump. 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 Um, that, that to me, I think, is, is where all this is going. When we talk about how you know one case begets like you know equal opposite reactions, I see that this like flurry of riffraffs that are going on all over the country, and this movement to try and assert that a person's religious belief should be allowed to trump existing civil law. That's, that's going to reach a crescendo, and eventually the Supreme Court is going to deny that. And, and they will have bitten off more than they can chew. They will have finally gone too far. And I think we're, we're going to end up with, I would say, within less than five years, I would predict, um, an actual decision that establishes that civil rights in a secular society are civil rights. You are entitled to believe whatever you want to believe. But your beliefs cannot overrule someone else's actual civil rights, um, and I and we've kind of been dancing around that as a society for generations, and I think that's really, in my opinion, where we're ultimately going. I don't know what kind of case it will be or how it will be. You guys are much smarter about that stuff than I am, but that seems to me to be where we're at. And I, I know I'm speaking to the converted when I say this, <laughs> so I probably don't need to, but. It, related to that though, it matters tremendously who will be nominating the next set of Supreme Court justices. Because the next president, given the age of several justices, the next president could be nominating not only to replace Scalia, but potentially two or three others. So it really matters who is not in the White House. Who's in the Senate? Yeah. Who's in the Senate? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yes. I have uh, always adopted the attitude that we are we're living right now through the past of our future. And um, we will remember this day if the wrong person ends up making that decision because we are stuck with the Supreme Court for at least a generation, generally speaking. And not all of them are going to turn into Anthony Kennedy, right? <laughs> and I know, Owen, you said the five of us, but <laughs> there's been so much brilliance shared already. Um, but I'll take it back to the political realm and say that, as, particularly looking at gender identity and how expansive the whole notion of gender is becoming, it really behooves the LGBT community to partner with the reproductive justice community and, and really, really move that so that we are talking about a real case that changes everything. Uh, really, really silly, because we need it. Um, is there another? Okay. Can I ask, uh, okay. I'm a total lay person. Does, does the panel have anything in the way of updates on employment, non-discrimination? I, mean, I think there was a lot of hope that it was going to be resolved through the legislative process, but maybe ultimately we'll have to rely on the courts in that instance, too. So the EEO, EEOC, which is the government agency that oversees enforcement of Title VII's prohibition on discrimination in employment, has come out with an opinion now in a case called Baldwin versus Fox. 
uh, that prohibitions on sex discrimination in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and this is consistent with also the Department of Education's interpretation, that, that Title VII prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation. They've also done a, a similar thing with respect to transgender rights as well, saying it prohibits discrimination based on, the, on gender identity as well. We are trying to make the point that this EEOC interpretation should govern in the courts. Um, so far, we've had some success in only two district court decisions, but the Seventh Circuit has heard a case, um, our case, on behalf of a woman named Kim Hindley from Indiana, who was dismissed, who was prevented from, from getting tenure and then they later dismissed because she's a lesbian. And the district court said, there's no law against firing lesbians, and we appealed that. Uh, and the Seventh Circuit, we argued that Title VII, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, does prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation because it prohibits discrimination based on sex. That was argued in September, and it is still hanging out there. Um, it was heard before a three-judge panel, um, one of whom was Judge Rovner, uh, and I, now I'm missing out on the other two names. Um, we are hopeful that the fact that it's been hanging out so long is because whoever it is who's writing a very lengthy opinion is writing the, <laughs> the majority one. <laughs> Fingers crossed on that. <laughs> similar activities going on in the 11th Circuit and a bunch of other places around the country. And that, that also points out the need for progressive political appointments, yeah. right? This is the thing that Molly Ivins was brilliant at in talking about George Bush as president. His impact was at every level of government. The people that, you know, licensed shrimp, shrimp uh, harvesters in New Orleans, everything at level of government. So Kai Feldblum is on the EEOC, an Obama appointee who is a lesbian, and she's helping interpret laws. So who, the, the impact of Obama's appointments, hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of LGBTs throughout the country has been phenomenal, and that's one perfect example. That's true. I think we have time for one last question. This is a little bit off the topic, but I'm curious about what you think the effect of the shooting in Orlando, because it seems like how is the, how is the, for all of you, how is the LBG community going to sort of help with gun legislation? And is that possible? What's interesting to think about, um, about Orlando is, it's in many ways the under 30 year olds that did not, I was talking to someone before, did not experience the AIDS crisis in the same way as many of us in this room did. And this is a pivot point in their minds of getting out of the comfort zone, that it isn't over, that there is so much to do, but also our allies, the, not just the PFLAG, but the other allies out there. Um, legislatively, people, I mean, it, you cannot say there isn't still a battle to fight when those kinds of things happen. And the most, the, to me, one of the most uh, amazing responses in Chicago to that was the night that it happened, the, the, that night, Sunday night, the rally in Boys Town. That vigil was coordinated by a group called Chicago Survivors. That's a mainstream organization of families who've lost their children to gun violence in Chicago. They coordinated that vigil. It was a lesbian who works there. That organization was actually founded by a lesbian couple who lost their son to gun violence. And it was, a, it was one of those brilliant intersectional moments that crisis bring about. And there were mothers and fathers who had their children's photos with them at that vigil, connected the dots more quickly than our community often connects the dots back. And so I have a lot of hope out of that that we will uh, be able to pivot that. And, and Kim and I at Pride Action Tank are, are uh, participating with the Commission on Human Relations and meeting with Chicago survivors to talk about how do we amplify what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure the LGBT community has a way in that that fits, right? You cannot force people to care and have empathy, but you can allow them the spaces to have that in, and that's what we want to create, and show support for Chicago survivors, because they showed support for our community without question. They showed up within hours of an event that, that you know, they, they understood it immediately, what this was. So, and also the fact that it was mostly Latino people and African American people, that was also in a critical uh, place for the community to 
to make sure that they acknowledged that, that that was, that was a point of that event that should not be ignored. So it provides us opportunity to work together better because we, one of the things that Kim and I, why we founded Pride Action Tank after the marriage fight was because legitimately many African American elected officials in Illinois had often said, well, where are you on, the, on our issues? Mm -hmm. Now we know that there are LGBTs of color who've been working on those issues, we know that. But they don't necessarily know that because it wasn't relevant all the time to talk about it that way. But it, on a visible level, on a transparent level, it wasn't always clear. And uh, so they weren't wrong to bring that up um, because our community has not always done a good job um, at showing up on multi, you know, on immigration issues and all that. We know individuals have, but not as a whole community. So I think this 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 incident allows us an opportunity that we should take advantage of in Chicago to help across better better across lines. <laughs> so, um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you to our panelists again. Let's give them another round.